Welcome to my talk. I'm Andrew Paxi. I'm a software engineer with Crown Equipment Corporation based in Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, the work I'm talking about today uh, was done in my own time, so it has no real relation to what I'm doing for my day job. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about backporting to the future, making um, a feature or function that was available in some future version of code, which in this case was a mock object library written in C14, and I needed to make that available in C11. Uh, the future part is to make sure that the project I was working on had a future. Um, it was not guaranteed as far as I was concerned when I joined it. So the overview of my talk is that I'm going to present a bit more motivation to why I undertook this task, introduce the library that I backported to C11, uh, can, uh, also with some goals that I needed to establish to figure out if I was going to be successful or not. Um, then I'm going to dive into a few of the features that the library used, uh, how each of those features can be backported to C11, and uh, then wrap that up with figuring out whether I was successful or not. So uh, let's get going. So basically, I had a project that needed more unit tests. 18 months ago, I was asked, could you work on this project, please? And I said, sure. And they said, oh, by the way, we don't seem to have that many unit tests for it. In fact, we have about three test suites and about 25 unit tests. And one of them's GP faulting at the moment. So yeah, we needed some unit, more unit tests. Um, and uh, so also they said to me, you get the chance to decide which frameworks to use for this project. So I rocked up and I said, well, catch is one of the four C's. Let's go use catch. Um, so the other three C's, I hope you know, is Conan, Sea Lion, and Sea Make. So uh, chose catch, quite happy with that. Um, had to the end of the week to choose a mocking framework. Um, which one would I choose? So. Given I'd chosen catch, I needed something to integrate with catch. I also basically given myself the task of working through to the end of the week to get this decision done. I didn't want to choose something that required us to have to mess with the build system. Uh, I figured, given the risk I was taking even use, introducing catch, um, I would maybe be able to add one more header, one more header only library to the system. I did need some portability in my requirements. I needed some thread safety. Um, and as I found out later, I needed to support C11. And I say I needed to find out later, I, I found out later, it's because I'd made a, a few mistakes. The first mistake I thought was that the project used GCC 493 with C14 mode enabled. Um, turned out it was 483, which is not really a great C14 compiler. Um, so, I mean, when I looked around, I have found out there are a bunch of mocking frameworks uh, to use. Google Mock was pretty close to the top of the list. Um, and also on the list was this library called Trompe l'oeil. I'm kind of padding the middle bits out because I didn't know anything about the libraries that were also listed there, but I've since come to learn that they're pretty decent libraries. And I think if you're making this decision in the same context as me, you might make a different choice. So I'm really talking to you about my choice and what I had to do. Near the bottom of the list was, well, maybe I could persuade the project managers to upgrade the compiler. Um, but here we are, 18 months along, and we're still using GCC 483. So I think I made the right call to maybe adjust my library before I adjust the compiler. The, um, the final choice, avoid mocking frameworks altogether, is still valid. Uh, I could have 
done what I've done on other projects, hand roll your mocks and get on with life. But um, I suppose I wanted a, something a little more closer to the abstractions and uh, that, that I wanted to express. I wanted to express my expectations in a language of expectations, basically. And I, so I'd found this library, Trompe l'Oeil. So the first part was really positive. Uh, I found a header-only library, and it's designed for C++, and it does mocking. Um, it was written by Bjorn Fahler. He's written and, and given a number of talks on his library. I, was, I watched those talks, and I was very impressed with the fit uh, uh, that that library was going to have with our project. Um, I put my picture there because I've since become a contributor to this project uh, for reasons you will find out during this talk. But the name of the project is worth spending a few seconds on. Um, I find it particularly apt that they use the term from art, trompe l'oeil. Um, it means to deceive the eye, um, quite literally. Um, in art circles, they mean they're referring to paintings that create the illusions of real objects or a scene. I like this one particularly because it's a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge drawn on a building that blocks the Brooklyn Bridge when you're standing in that position in New York. Um, Richard Haas drew that mural in 1978. I think that is kind of one of the perfect examples of what we're talking about here. And mock fra object frameworks are really specialised um, libraries for providing the same kind of illusion to your production code. I should say at this point that uh, as, as a sort of a warning, the objects in this talk are not what they seem. And this talk may, create, may contain traces of ASCII art. Um, so we're going to move on to that in a few minutes. OK, so what are the main features of the library? It basically provides mock functions uh, for you to substitute for your production functions. Um, expectations, which are um, calls with arguments and values, returning values that you want um, your production code to um, consume. Matches and modifiers also provide refinements to those, those um, expectations. And we'll walk through that in a few, the next few slides in more detail. There are other features in the library um, for sequencing expectations, the order that you expect the um, system under test to uh, make the, the um, calls to your mock objects. Uh, we can monitor lifetime of objects. I like the name of this one. It's called a death watched um, uh, class. Um, there's quite a bit of integration into te other test frameworks. Not only does this library integrate into catch, but also boost test, G, uh, G test if you want, um, and maybe three or four others which are quite popular. And uh, Finally, it's also got the ability to trace the way your expectations are being used in the system. So let's take a look at um, mock classes and functions in a little more detail. Taking this example of some interface declaring a few functions that you would um, derive an actual um, concrete um, class from. In uh, Trompe l'oeil and other mocking frameworks, you basically derive your mock class from the interface and then define your mock functions. Oh, I promised ASCII art, here it is. Um, so your mock functions are what we, um, or are the outcomes of, of, of placing those macros inside your mock class. Mock classes don't have to be derived from interfaces, it's just a mock class contains mock functions. Um, so there's a bit of complications here, um, brought about by C++ a little bit. Uh, we have to name the number of parameters that our mock functions are taking. That's what the mock, the one at the end of the mock 
Mach 1 is all about. And you also have to be a little bit explicit about whether the functions are const or non-const. And that's why we end up with macros that look like const mock 0 in, in our code, in our declarations. But still, it's fairly succinct, and it gets the job done. OK, so the next part of uh, where do you use your, your mock objects and, your, and where do you set expectations, things that you hope your function under test is going to um, call. Well, we do them in our test cases, and this has um, been written in, in catch, and uh, we're really focused on getting the setup phase of your test case all sorted, right, and set up and set. So basically, um, this is where this is what we call the expectation. Uh, it's, it's it's basically saying uh, when set value is called on this mock object, uh, let's make sure it only performs the actions that we specify when it matches when the call has these arguments matched. Um, then we can further refine whether the actions are performed based on some modifiers. And one of the modifiers that we specified in this example is to return the result of some expression. Uh, the underscore one are placeholder values. We should be quite familiar with placeholders from uh, bind and other, other um, function-oriented uh, libraries. Right, so expectations, the first one we saw was called require, that means you must, this, we expect this to happen. If it doesn't happen, signal some kind of error to the test system. You can also specify to, uh, that any kind of, you allow the call any number of times with the allow call. We could say, nip, I really don't want this call to have happened, it's a failure if it occurs. That's what the forbid call is, is specifying. So. Um, with the matches, uh, they, they basically refine um, the situations in which those expectations will be fired. Um, the first kind of matcher uh, basically is a wildcard, except any kind of argument with any kind of type. Uh, you can restrict the types of matching, or you can do your basic comparisons, equality, less than, equal to, um, or match based on regular expression. You can take all of that above lists of comparison types and negate them, and you can do automatic pointer dereferencing with the final operator. These are pretty useful, useful things. Um, we, I think, the, if I can be sort of parenthetical about this a little bit, there are a reasonable substitute for having to design a full expression evaluation language in, um, in the, in the uh, um, expectation code. Modifiers do something. Um, they can further restrict the kind of situations that the expectation will fire, or they can do base, they can emulate the three kinds of actions that functions will normally do, such as producing a side effect on some piece of global memory. They can uh, obviously specify the return value of the function, or if the function is intended to fail in the, in the, under the conditions that you specify, through an exception, you can make the throw expression uh, your action for, for the um, expectation. Uh, the named parameters uh, serve as your placeholders, um, underscore 1 through 15. Uh, there's more, this, this is basically an overview, there's more to be said about modifying local references and other things in the library, I'm not going to cover them off today. Here's a little more of an extended example. Uh, let's say you have this kind of production code that I've highlighted here. Uh, basically, you've got an interface. Oh, well, the, in the production system, you've got some kind of engine. It relies on some kind of database. 
uh, which it takes as its initial parameter when it's constructed, and uh, there's an actual database somewhere in the production code uh, to provide the lookup function for you. The main purpose of the engine is to do some kind of computation on a key or on a value returned by a lookup from the database and uh, return that result to, to the rest of the production code. When the system is under test, we've swapped out the production class for the mock class. It's got the same interface as the um, database. Uh, it just happens to be specified as, as a mock um, function. In the test case, which is the, the code we see here, um, it's basically we're following the, the four, phase, four phases of a test. Um, we, we perform the setup where we get the mock database created. We set the expectations on what the system under test is supposed to do to that database. Um, and then we exercise that system that we've just set up by saying, let's compute something. And after that call, we make sure that we verify that we got what we expected. And then we tear the whole test down. In the case of um, Trompe l'oeil, it uh, performs its final verification that the expectation was actually triggered uh, during the destructor phase when we're leaving that scope. So uh, it's been pointed out that that might be a little bit of a dangerous thing to do. Um, but, you know, we, we can carry on in that situation. Right, so I was faced with the necessity of getting C++14 API working in a C++11 context. Uh, so the kinds of things I needed to achieve for this project was it basically uh, you haven't really succeeded if you ha don't port the API. So I needed expectations, matches, and modifiers to work in pretty much the same semantics as in the C++14 case. I, since this was a, a system that had, um, had a number of platforms to support, I wanted to make sure I supported the same platforms, not just my GCC 483. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't break C++14 compatibility implementing this, this back port. So, um, how did, why, what do you need to do to be able to achieve such a set of goals? Well, with this project, I needed to identify what, what, what was special, what, what special set of C++14 features this library used as opposed to um, uh, what it would do in C++11. So uh, this is split into two parts the library features we used and the language features we used. To use too many of these features in the port was not going to be pretty unsuccessful. Um, and, uh, but it turned out that there is a, a core of features that were, were used. And for, for the library part, um, there were a couple of features that were really just part of the unit tests for the, for the library. Um, so user-defined literals for strings and uh, a dual range equal were used in the test cases. I decided to leave those parts of the tests as C++14 only, and it was, and I was able to move on. In the remaining cases, uh, such as um, getting some uses of const extra for tuple and um, some some underscore T versions of helpers, uh, ty uh, what was it? alias templates, um, make unique in the integer sequence things. They were, they were pretty easy to identify, and I think we came up with some pretty good solutions on the library front. There are also some language features that were, were used, um, and these, when, I, when they were used, they were used deeply. Um, not just in some kind of shallow way. This is why I think Trompe l'oeil is a C++14 library top to bottom. It uh, really pushed the use of um, 
uh, generalized uh, generic lambda expressions, I think, were pushed to the lowest level of the system. Uh, but also had to deal with decal type auto um, and these other features, which I'm going to go into in detail in just a few seconds. So, so having introduced what features we used, uh, let's look at how we can backport each of them to C++11. So the basic approach for a library transformation is uh, I chose to nest the namespace within namespace trompe and called namespace detail, which is completely familiar to those who have used the boost library, I would hope. Uh, then that's where you dropped in the that's where you drop in your implementations of of the library library functions that you were using. We call the namespace detail entities by renaming all of the stud make uniques to detail make unique, for example. And then you inject those namespace detail functions. Uh, or, so, sorry, since now you are using namespace detail for everything in your code, when C++14 comes along, you need to have some kind of implementation. Why not the standard library implementation? Get those names into your namespace detail. There are three methods that I considered. Um, the one that I've gone with first is was namespace e detail equals namespace standard because the second method you are using declaration for each of the standard library um, methods didn't actually work for Visual Studio and uh, which was disappointing but there you go since fixed I think right so uh, which actual functions did we need in the case of, um, so there are three main libraries that needed, uh, that we used C++14 features from, uh, the headers. The first was the memory header where we needed make unique. And I um, implemented the version uh, that Stefan Lavoade, um provided in his working paper for C++14. And thank you for that. And for the type trays, we uh, just basically took the implementations that Walter Brown provided in his working paper and dropped them into namespace detail. Thank you for that. And for utility, we got exchange, uh, integer sequences, and uh, in the case of make integer sequence, Peter Dimoff's implementation uh, was the one I chose. And I thank Jeffrey Yeskin and Jonathan Wakeley and Peter Dimoff for those implementations. Uh, it's worth pointing out that I didn't take anything from anywhere because uh, I wanted um, license compatibility with the current licensing of Trompe So um, it, it's licensed under the Boost software license. Um, I didn't want to take anything that provided extra constraints on the current users of the library. That's why uh, a boost implementation was used for make integer sequence in this case. So the language is where it gets interesting. Uh, basically we've got to deal with generic lambda expressions, your generalized lambda captures, your return type deduction, and your Decal type auto. I'm tackling this order in this order because I want to leave decal type auto to last. <laughs> All right. So basically, a generic lambda expression is a lambda that takes auto in its parameter specification. Here's an example, and probably the simplest example I could find, um, because as Toby said in his last talk because I wrote it, <laughs> and um, that's, uh, so the auto in the um, parameter lists makes this a generic lambda expression. You just, uh, the x is going to be deduced when the lambda is used. Uh, they can also be variadic in C++14. 
Uh, so they look like similar to this, if you should find one in the wild. Um, this one is just really a forwarding lambda for some purpose, probably explanatory purposes at this point. Uh, so the techniques for replacing such a generic lambda basically fall into three different types in sort of graded difficulty. The best way to replace your generic lambda when you've got one is to actually use a lambda if you happen to know the types of the arguments up front. Okay, so replace your auto x with int x and you can move on. If you have to, you can use a functor, which is a function object in the, the um, named specifications in the standard. Um, this is a, basically a class with a function call operator. I'm going to just invent a term called generic functor at this point. I don't know if it's a term of art, but it helps me with the rest of my talk. Um, so a function, a, a class with a function call operator with a, a that is a member template. I'm just going to call it generic functor. You can replace functions with generic functors even if uh, you happen to be return have that in a return statement, and that's uh, while possible in the cases I encountered. It might not be possible in general. I haven't investigated that one completely. So let's say we've come back to our original example. Uh, this code gets turned into this, this functor, or generic functor. Uh, so it's been given, uh, this is the closure type for this lambda. It takes um, its argument to the function call operator, uh, which is defined as const, because we didn't define the lambda as mutable and uh, we deduce the return type. In this case, it's not, it's why it's, it's not fully converted yet, I, I'm guessing. Well, maybe it is, maybe it is. Um, when we do this in the trompe l'oeil library, this is a simplified example of code from the library. Uh, the kinds of simplifications include demangling the names of, of, um, of the identifiers in the, in the class. Oh, because you really want to keep your names distinct in library code from any kind of user code that comes along. So this lambda is used in the um, reporting system, uh, takes um, some kind of value and we print it on the other side of the equal sign. So this is what I call the equal printer. And we've transformed it into a C++ uh, 11 class that can be used and provide equivalent functionality. Um, let's move on to generalized lambda captures, which basically they, they look like this. They are, between the square brackets, you can not only rename the data member inside your closure type, you can also, also give it a generic or general expression to initialize it with. And uh, they're pretty useful, especially if your P happens to be move only, as in this case. Um, they can also be useful in the cases where the object is fairly large, to, uh, expensive to copy. Some people, uh, yeah, the confusion of speed to copy versus size, I suppose, is don't want to fall into this time. Uh, so what do we do to help replace all of these um, lambda captures? Well, basically, this is the place inside your closure type where you need to specifically define var member variables and define a constructor to get them initialized. So. There's a second method, however, which Myers points out in his Effective Modern C++ book, uh, where you can use bind uh, to capture the object uh, that you want and to in provide to the um, body of your lambda and um, make sure your lambda takes that 
uh, object by reference. I encourage you to go and look at that example if that's what you need. I've used that before in other production code, but I didn't use it in particular for this library. Um, so let's go transform our example uh, from C14 to C11. We do it like this. We make sure we have a constructor that can initialize our new member variable and use that mem renamed member variable in the body of our function call operator. And that's, that's the step required for that transformation. Okay, well, we did this in exactly one place in the trompe library. And that was uh, here in some of the reg regular expression code. We needed to pass in and capture the regular expression uh, in, from this function argument. And I've omitted a lot of details just to try and help you focus on this RE, um, which is eventually passed into regex search. The transformation was make a generic functor which has does the work in the constructor of capturing RE, uh, storing it away inside this member variable until it needs to be used inside the body of the function call operator. And you can try this at home, if, I guess. Um, the third kind of language support that was introduced in C14 but is absent from C++11 is the return type deduction. And Jason Merrill's paper on uh, introducing both return type deduction and uh, decal type auto was um, instrumental, I think, in helping me understand what was intended. Uh, so basically, in C++14, you can uh, have a complicated function, one with more than one return statement, and if the, uh, when the first return statement is encountered in a function declared with a return type of auto, the auto gets deduced, and uh, so long as the remaining expressions used in the return statements are um, compatible with that deduced type, the function as a whole is well formed. Uh, this is not so in C11. But we can make it so if you use a trailing return type. And this is really the only way, um, I, I, I will boldly assert in this talk. <laughs> but uh, so given this multiple return type, return statement uh, function, we help the compiler out by providing in the trailing return type the type we think those return statements should be. In trompe away, we did something very similar, again using the regular expression matching as an example. Uh, here we have the C14 code, which really, when you look at it, does some, returns something fairly complicated, but it has a type. Don't worry about that. Um, we're going to call that type R in the transformed example. And in the uh, transformed code, we use a trailing return type of decal type R. It's very interesting. So we've managed to knock three out of four off it during the time I worked on this um, back port. The fourth one is decal type auto. And um, in Merrill's paper, he describes the reasons for why decal type auto exists, uh, which basically is there are situations when plain old auto just don't work for you. And uh, so instead of using the rules of template argument deduction to, to implement auto, use the rules of decal type to deduce the type by surrounding your auto with the decal type auto syntactic sugar. 
Um, so, how do we tackle this? Pretty much the same way as you tackle uh, any use of auto. If you are certain of what the type is, put that type there, move on. Uh, if you're not so certain, maybe you can get by with the trailing return type and auto. And so we have one case where we use decal type auto and it matters, and that's in implementing the return macro. And it's a modifier of the expectations, if you recall. And uh, what we do here is having analyzed the entire source code of trompe and deduced that decal type auto here is pretty close to some invented type called return of t. Um, that is the return type of the function that you placed in the expectation. And I say pretty close uh, because it's, uh, this code doesn't perform the same way as the C++14 version because of eager evaluation of um, the type of whatever VA args is. There's an implicit conversion done in the return statement to get whatever VA args is converted to return of T, and sometimes that fails uh, in, uh, too, too early in the compilation process. There was another point to this slide, which was um, made to me when I gave an earlier version of this talk, which was, why didn't you just move the VA args up into the, the decal type auto? So make it decal type double underscore VA args up double underscore. And the reason I couldn't do that is because the placeholders are defined inside the body of the function, and the VA args actually names those uh, entities and they don't exist at the time that um, the compiler is parsing the return type, the trailing return type. So we'll um, start to look at another case um, from the placeholder code. When you have uh, arg, to, uh, when you're, uh, I'll go back one slide, when you're defining your placeholders, you'd, we use an internal function called arg to unpack basically a tuple and grab the correct argument for, for the um, initialization of the placeholder. Uh, here we had um, decal type auto in the return type. The transformation was basically to use auto and trailing return type because at the time uh, you need the type it, uh, from, from the arguments you're passing in, the, um, the, the trailing return time, t uh, re trailing return type is the place where you can get that information. So it seems like we were doing pretty well uh, until I found out that I couldn't really implement the expectation API at all. Um, because when you're defining this expectation, you have the form of basically require something, a dot, and a modifier, a return. Okay, so in the require call, this is basically a macro that expands to an expression yielding an object. Then you use the dot, which is a member access operator, which you can't overload. And then you provide a modifier which is a macro that yields a member function call. That handle return that I used a couple of slides ago, that's a member function call that gets invoked with an argument. That argument happens to be that lambda that we were manipulating earlier. And the result of all of that is still an expression for which more modifiers can be added. Now all of these macro preprocessor expansions are occurring at kind of a, the same level of context. And it, no matter what I could do so far, I'm not giving up, but I'm pretty sure I'm 
I've reached the, the sort of point of minimized my benefits or maximized my benefits. Uh, so we haven't found a way so far to transmit type information between one macro expansion, the require call, and the place where it's needed, the return macro. And um, so the resolution of that was to change the API and changed it in subtle ways. Bef where before you had the macro, the dot, and the next macro, we now have the macro and the, the dot modifier sort of in the same macro expansion. We u I use the subscript underscore v, um, which stands for variadic in this case. It's sort of similar to variadic macros that came out of Boost um, preprocessor. And so we got, so we got there in the end with the expectation API. But I didn't do it immediately. This was something that I took three goes at getting right. The first example of this macro, or of, of trying to transmit type information, had a kind of a hash define, the type I wanted, put the ex expectation in, and then hash undef this transmitting macro. And that sucked. The second form used the underscore v, but I had a special case for zero argument macros. And th then I was able to transform this and eliminate the special case. And the third API looks pretty stable now. The good news is that you can use both the C++, if you're in C++14 mode, you've still got the C++11 API to use. And the good news about that is that if you've written all of your test cases in C++11 and with these new macros and you feel that the future is with the other set of macros, you can incrementally transform between APIs and have both of them compile in the same, at the same time in the code base. I thought that was, that was kind of uh, an extra goal I had to achieve to make any of this project fly. Okay. And if I, I'm going to return to this uh, return macro a little bit. It doesn't quite work because of eager evaluation of the um, VA args. Uh, so in the C++14 API, we've provided a bit of help uh, to short circuit the um, compilation process if we get the types of our arguments wrong. Uh, so we're static we've run static asserts inside that handle return function. Those are still in the code, but they're not doing the job they should have done because they never get called because or evaluated because we've already got an error message because of an implicit conversion failing uh, earlier in the code. So the end result is some less helpful error messages um, and uh, really uh, but um, which affects our unit tests more than it affects you, I think. You still get an error novel, uh, but you are going to get a broken compilation anyway. Okay. Um, it's worth pointing out that GCC 483 didn't provide everything I needed, even in C11 mode. Uh, Three types of problem that I encountered with that compiler was that regex was only partially implemented. Uh, everything links, but the, uh, when, when the code runs, it produces, uh, perhaps it kind of fails fast, it fails with false or fails with true on some APIs. Um, that's well known. Um, in fact, Jonathan Wakeley said, Maybe a few weeks after the code was released, he says pretty much sigh. I can't. I thought everyone in the world knew about this <laughs> by now, um, but I found out in 2017. So there you go. Um, there are some problems with conversion operators errors. That was sort of annoying. It reduced the number of test cases I had active in my C++11 mode. 
and it turned out also that tuple was broken. Um, the only way I could get for go forward with this project was that to actually inject a header from GCC 484 into my 483 system. Okay, so let's review what I set out to do and whether I achieved it. Um, did I get expectations implemented? Not really, I, Im I implemented a different API. My matches kind of worked except the, the uh, not and the um, wildcard matching. Uh, this is across all compilers, this is really. My modifiers sort of worked except for the return modifier. But we had some wins. We got our, the same compilers and perhaps even a few more working during the course of this project. And I did preserve C14 compatibility, which I was pretty happy with. Um, let's say we're not really backporting, but porting to the future. And you have a C11 program and you want to make it C14 ish. Well, I think there's something you can learn from this project, and that is all of the code transformations that I used to revert from 14 to 11 can be reversed and you can go from 11 to 14 in a more idiomatic way. So you've got, if you've defined closure types or using bind or um, you've had to use trailing return types, you can start erasing those and, and, re, and refactoring your code uh, to achieve a, a, a better, more idiomatic C++14 system. Uh, and sure, you can go further. This library didn't use everything that's available in C++14. I've got a list for you to review or, or use as a touchstone uh, in the appendix, uh, which really rounds out all of the C++14 functionality and where to go find it. Um, from a working paper's point of view. Probably the best place to find it actually is in the standard, but, or CPP reference, or ask a friend, or <laughs> something else. <laughs> but, you know, if you happen to just, if all you have is this, is this talk, then, then you'll be able to find it. Okay, so that rounds out my talk. Uh, I really enjoyed working on this project. Uh, took up a lot of my spare time for the last 18 months, and um, I found Bjorn a, a really helpful guide in, uh, in um, my journey to become a contributor in the open source project world. So thank you very much. Uh, could you clarify what is happening with that R? Right. Okay, um, I just decided I needed a shorthand. When, when I was looking at the style of the code <coughs> in that location, it, it kind of had enforced a fairly hard 80 character li limit. If you are um, just dropping, if you want the type of that here, you can, of course, just take all of that and move it into this location here. Yeah. And I decided I didn't really f like the look of it. So I thought, well, why not invent a, a, play, a, a type name somewhere? And let's call it R for return and drop it up as a default argument to the template. And it's just, you might not do that. Um, but on that day, I felt this was looking pretty cool. So in place of a minute, you would actually put that block of text, or is it just for the presentation uh, purposes? I actually have transformed this for the, and demangled a bunch of things. There's also, there are other types that support whatever this uh, overloader, uh, partially specialized, uh, free fu function overload, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's there are different type names for that uh, in the code as well. So I used those instead. 
so yeah, I had to do some work just to get it on the slide. And like the word omitted should give you a clue that I was <laughs> fudging a few things. Uh, so your choice. Um, I, I had hoped I would get some clarity, but obviously you've helped me get there. <laughs> Uh, so just on, on the same slide, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, the uh, the use of the uh, trailing return type there um, and, and the, uh, and the um, default template parameter um, changes the behavior of this template slightly in terms of um, if there's some sort of um, error um, in the substitution of those things so so um, I mean I, I might, might be mistaken but I think the one will, oh, the C++ 14 one will give you a hard error if there's some um, error in the body of the function but you might get uh, Svena happening in, in the right hand side is that is that a, an issue that came up at all uh, I can't tell you all I can tell you is for the unit tests I that were written uh, this passed all of them, so um, it's quite possible. I and uh, but a little bit beyond what I was trying to achieve immediately. I have this feeling, however, that there are a number of really, really subtle problems hiding inside this code, whether the pre-transformed code or the post-transformed code, and. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's just this code. I think most <laughs> most code is full of <laughs> yeah. subtle problems waiting to come out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was uh, curious. So about your contributions, and so are they now part of as the trunk or the ongoing development of this um, library, or have you? Are they applied to perhaps a release branch that is um, sorry I didn't, should have written, thought a little bit harder before I started using my mouth um, it, your contributions are now permanently part of this project that will be ongoing uh, or, or are they on a branch that is specific right. to a, a, like a C, if you need C++ 11 compatibility use this branch, this release branch right. series. Okay, um, so the question is, are the, is this code on master? And the answer is yes. This was merged back in uh, three releases ago, around about March in 2018. So this is, uh, this is reflected in the main code base now. Mm. 